Each year, one in 100,000 people in the United States are diagnosed with an acoustic neuroma brain tumor. And since 1981, the Acoustic Neuroma Association has been offering patients and their caregivers the support and information they need to make educated decisions and engage with a passionate community of peers. The ANA provides the most comprehensive, up-to-date patient materials, access to in-person and virtual support groups, informative webinars, and an active online community. The ANA also provides funding for important medical research and studies, and connects patients to the medical community. The Acoustic Neuroma Association is the premier resource for the acoustic neuroma community, now and for decades to come. Good morning and welcome to our last day of presentations with the Mayo Clinic team. They have spent this week sharing information with us and answering questions on various topics important to the AN community. And once again, I would like to thank them. We're all very appreciative of their efforts and their candor. And it's been a great experience for our organization to work with this team. I hope our attendees have learned a lot as well. I'm sure they have. We're here today with Dr. Michael Link, one of the neurosurgeons at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And today we're gonna to talk about radiation, what to expect and how to prepare. Before we get started, I just wanna go over a little bit how our presentation will work today. All of our attendees are muted, so you're listening only. And um, if you have questions, you can type them into the question box. If you're in the webinar that is located in your toolbar, there's a button you can click. Um, on Facebook, you can go ahead and just add your questions to the comment section, we're monitoring that. There should be com um, captions at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see those, you can click another button in your toolbar, it says captions. And on Facebook, if you need to activate those, you may have to go to your settings to do that. Otherwise, they should just appear. We are recording this presentation and we will house it on the AN Awareness Week landing page in the presentation section. We will also keep it on our Facebook page and it'll be in the video library on our website. There are still lots of ways to get involved with AN Awareness Week, even though it's kind of winding down. You can go to uh, our website at www.anausa.org and click on the uh, slider on the home page. That'll take you to our landing page, which has everything you uh, need to know. So, all right, Dr. Link, thank you so much for being here today. You wanna go ahead and get started? We're ready. Right, uh, you can hear me okay? Yes, I can. <clears throat> Fantastic. Um, I did prepare just a short uh, slide presentation. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, I believe here. Yes, I am. And I'm going to click share and go to slideshow. Um, now, let's see, I think, let me try this. There we go. Now, are you seeing my title slide and nothing else? Exactly. Yep. That's okay. exactly what we see. Perfect. Oh, holy cow. I did it right. All right. Great job. We forgot yeah. to practice that. Uh, yes. It's uh, <laughs> a little bit more complicated than doing radio surgery. <laughs> So uh, I'm one of the neurosurgeons here at uh, a Mayo Clinic, and uh, I do both microsurgery and radiosurgery. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've treated, um, I've operated about 850 acoustic neuromas over my career so far, and I've actually also treated myself about 850 patients with radiosurgery uh, over my career. So we have uh, quite good experience with both treatments. And I wanna talk a bit uh, today about uh, what we tell patients before radio surgery and after uh, radio surgery, and then answer uh, questions as they come in. So um, I don't have anything to uh, disclose. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest. Um, I think it's worth pointing out here at Mayo Clinic, we're all on salary. Uh, we don't have any incentive to treat patients. So my, my paycheck doesn't change no matter how many patients I operate or radiate, just like every other physician at the Mayo Clinic. And people often ask, well, what, what exactly is radio surgery? Um, and um, uh, this is a picture of Lars Lexell, who um, 
is a, a very famous a neurosurgeon from Sweden who really invented the gamma knife and coined the term radiosurgery. And the best definition now is basically radiosurgery is radiation delivered in one to five fractions or one to five treatments to an image-defined target with maximal sparing of the surrounding tissue. And this was first done by Lars Lexell way back in 1951 <clears throat> excuse me, so, uh, you know, 60 years ago, and obviously the technique and the devices that deliver it have been refined uh, very much over the last 60 years, but the principle remains the same. And um, if you study the history of medicine and so on, you come across a few people who are absolute geniuses, who absolutely changed the course of the profession and were able to think about problems in a way that nobody else could think about them. And Lars Lexell was clearly one of those uh, people. Um, I, I never met him, unfortunately, he died the year I actually started medical school. So I, I never uh, met him, but his legacy uh, very much uh, lives on. And the reason why, the reason why he developed radio surgery is in the days of his training, um, you know, neurosurgery was an extraordinarily risky undertaking. The morbidity was very high and the mortality was very high. And he said, there has to be a way uh, to do this without putting the patient at so much risk. This is a figure from our recent New England Journal of Medicine uh, paper that Dr. Carlson and I uh, published last month. And it just shows the different treatment devices now that are available that can be used to deliver radiation to acoustic neuromas. And I'll go through that in some detail. So uh, this is the picture of the CyberKnife. Um, and what this is, you can see my arrow move around here on the screen. This is a linear accelerator that delivers photons, that delivers uh, x-rays basically, hooked to a robotic arm. And uh, this can move around in all different uh, ways in arcs, so to speak. So the beam comes in in various different ways to provide a very conformal uh, treatment. And typically what we think about in all these devices is what is the fall off? So let's say we give this tumor 13 gray. So radiation is measured in units of gray. Um, so that's a very standard dose to say, we're gonna give 13 gray. The fall off of this radiation um, is not quite as steep with the gamma knife. So we treat at the 80% isodose line meaning that the whole tumor gets at least 80% of the dose and somewhere in, in here gets 100% of the dose. And then these are the other lower radiation isodose lines. This is a different linear accelerator based uh, unit where the unit can swivel around the patient's head and the bed can turn somewhat. And you can see it does basically about the same thing. So this tumor got 12 and a half gray at the 80% line. And you can see this orange line would be the eight gray line. In this white line is the six gray line. This is the brain stem here outlined in blue. Um, so the brain stem gets very low dose and the tumor gets the necessary dose to stop it from growing. And this is what the uh, gamma unit uh, looks like. Uh, this is the latest version of the gamma unit. Um, and basically how this works is there are 192 cobalt 60 radiation sources housed in a big steel ball around the patient's head. And they're collimated so the beams come out and we put the patient's tumor where all 192 beams intersect. And that gives... Uh, a very conformal radiation dose plan with a very steep fall off, meaning, so this is, we usually prescribe to the 50% isodose line. So 13 gray at the 50%, meaning somewhere in here gets 26 gray. And then this is the 20% line, which would uh, be only 5.2 gray. And you can see that uh, the brainstem receives very low dose. 
So what's the difference between these different devices and techniques? And it, it turns out when you really study the literature um, in terms of outcomes, the outcomes are really not significantly different. We installed our gamma unit 31 years ago in 1990. Um, and so we've treated now more than a thousand patients altogether. Uh, so we have very good experience with this. We never felt the reason to get a different device because the gamma unit works very well. Most of the time to do gamma knife radio surgery, uh, that's a head frame based technique. Those other techniques I showed you are a mask based technique where there's a thermoplastic mask that is formed to cover the patient's face to kind of help them hold still. With gamma knife, we use a stereotactic head frame. So that helps hold the patient's head still. For the ever and ever people have debated, would you rather have a mask on your face or would you rather have a head frame attached to your head? Frankly, it, it, it doesn't uh, uh, really matter. The other thing I'll point out about this picture is here we've outlined the cochlea in pink. And you can see we can make these dose plans so the cochlea receives very low dose, um, which may be helpful, although it's quite debatable in terms of hearing preservation uh, long term. So who's a candidate for radio surgery? Who can undergo this treatment? Well, basically it's any patient with a tumor less than two and a half centimeters in cerebellopontine angle diameter, the part near the brainstem. And in fact, we can even expand that. And we have treated tumors even bigger than three centimeters in certain indications where we felt that was only uh, treatment available to that patient. Um, with Gamma Knife, it's really a one day treatment. With these other devices, you can fractionate it, meaning you can um, give the dose uh, spread out over three or five days. And sometimes that allows for a safer treatment of a larger tumor. But a good rule of thumb is about two and a half uh, centimeters. And so what happens the day of radio surgery? So if the patient's decided that's the treatment they're gonna have, and we agree that's a good treatment for them. So step number one is you gotta show up early at the hospital. Um, and I'm mainly going to talk about gamma knife radio surgery, just because that's the procedure that I do. Um, but uh, the variations with cyber knife or other linear accelerator based treatments, um, the concepts are ba basically very much the same. Um, and then the first step of the process is we apply the stereotactic head frame. And how we do that is we have the patient sitting up on the cart and we wash up their scalp with some alcohol, and then we numb up four places on the scalp using local anesthetic, similar to what the dentist does when he works on your teeth. And when we inject that numbing medicine, it stings and burns for about 30 seconds to a minute. Then everything's numb, and we can attach this, uh, this frame with these four pins that go through the scalp. Uh, these don't leave any permanent marks. Uh, and that holds this head frame in place. And that head frame serves two purposes. One is that it holds the patient's head still during the treatment, and it guides the position of the head in the gamma unit. And also, when we do the imaging, we put a special what's called a fiducial box or a marker box on this head frame. And that gives us appropriate imaging that we can use to calculate the stereotactic coordinates of where the tumor is located inside the head. It allows the head frame to work as a GPS system, basically. So once the head frame's on, then we do two sets of images. We do a special what's called cone beam CT, which takes about a minute. So this is the latest uh, version of the gamma unit. It's called the icon. And the patient's head sits in here. This is actually a cone beam CT that comes down and then it rotates around the head and it gives us a CT picture of the patient's head. That's done without any contrast. Again, it's a painless one minute scan. <clears throat> but it gives us very, very accurate stereotactic uh, coordinates. Uh, so we get submillimeter accuracy 
even below 0 0.3 millimeter accuracy. Then we transfer the patient up to the MRI scanner and we do an MRI scan with contrast that takes about 10 to 15 minutes. So it's a much shorter MRI scan than most people are used to. And we can combine the CT and the MRI to plan the treatment. And this is basically what that kind of looks like. So we have our MRI here with our tumor and we put these what we call isocenters or shots uh, on the tumor. So you can see this plan had six different shots and these red lines are the different isocenters. So we can collimate the radiation to be a 16 millimeter kind of sphere or an eight millimeter sphere or a four millimeter sphere or you can block some of the sectors so you get an oblong kind of shape or a shape that looks like a lemon. And you can put all these together in with what, what I'll call very complicated physics. Uh, you get a summed radiation dose that very conformally fits the tumor. This is all done behind the scenes while the patient's basically sitting on their cart, reading a book or watching TV or talking to the nursing staff or so on. Take a plan for a vestibular schwannoma probably takes somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes. And then we do the treatment. So the patient is taken into the unit and this head frame is secured to the treatment couch there's a big door here that opens and the patient goes in this far, basically just up to the shoulders. So people often worry, you know, they'll say, gosh, I'm claustrophobic. MRIs are very difficult. Uh, and um, um, I volunteered for a research study many years ago, and that included having an MRI scan of your brain. <laughs> and I agree that uh, I didn't realize I was a bit claustrophobic, but I'm a bit claustrophobic. And it's, it's kind of hard to be in an MRI scanner. This is not a claustrophobic experience. Um, it's noiseless and painless. You don't feel the radiation or hear the radiation. Nothing heats up. You won't lose any hair with treatment. You don't become sunburned. With this type of radiation treatment also, you don't become radioactive, so you can walk right out of the hospital at the end of the treatment. There's no quarantine after this kind of treatment. Um, so it turns out cobalt-60, which is the main radiation source in a gamma unit, decays at a rate of a half-life of a little over five years. So uh, the treatment time for a typical acoustic neuroma is somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on the complexity of the plan and how old the cobalt is. We reload our gamma unit every five years. So the exact same treatment on the day after the reload takes twice as long five years later. But still, the, tre the treatment is relatively short, and it's a bit boring, frankly, for the patient. The machine just moves you in and out for each shot. You don't feel anything or hear anything. And then once you're done, we take you out. We take the head frame off, put a little dressing on the head, let you have lunch and leave the hospital. There's no restrictions afterwards. You know, after surgery, we tell people no heavy lifting, no exertional type work. Following gamma knife, you can go back to regular activities. Uh, you may develop some swelling around the pin sites or around the eyes. We put a lot of medicine in to make it numb. Um, but there's, but once again, they don't leave any permanent marks, but occasionally somebody will look like they went a few rounds with Mike Tyson. They'll get really swollen up and bruised, but, but that all goes away. Occasionally people will have a mild headache from having the head frame on or feel some fatigue, I suppose. Um, I do gamma knife every Thursday and I always tell patients take Friday off and you can go back to work on Monday. And what happens with this? Well, one of the first things I think you have to understand is the goal of the treatment is just to stop the tumor from growing. It's not, uh, it's not going to make the tumor disappear or shrink away. But um, if you look at all the results available in the literature from our center and, and many, many other centers in the United States and around the world, overall, if you say the goal of the treatment is just to get the tumor to stop growing, we achieve that goal somewhere 93 to 95% of the time. 
The risk of facial weakness is less than 1% using current techniques and doses. One of the issues is what happens to hearing. So unlike with surgery, where patients either wake up with hearing or they don't, uh, with Gamma Knife, we often see the hearing will decline over follow-up. So over the first, um, let's say five years, about half the people we treat who start out with what we consider to be useful hearing, meaning they can pick up a telephone and use that ear to hear, can no longer do that. Half the patients can't do that by five years. And about 75% can't do that at 10 years meaning that the hearing can continue to consistently decline even though the tumor isn't growing and we're saying the treatment is a success. There's lots of reasons why we think perhaps that's the case, but the important thing from the patient's perspective is you have to understand that. Now, there are some patients clearly that maintain good hearing, lifelong good tumor control. One thing people ask is, well, what if I'm dizzy? Will it make my dizziness worse or will it make my dizziness better? Or if I'm not dizzy, will this make me dizzy? And just like with observation, the um, dizziness outcome is very unpredictable. It is rare indeed that people develop new prolonged significant dizziness after radio surgery. Um, the big risk factor, like we've talked about in some other sessions, for being dizzy long-term is being dizzy before you had the treatment. So we don't really cure dizziness by treating the tumor, but if you're not dizzy going into it, it's not likely you'll suffer with dizziness at some point afterwards. A couple of questions that uh, always come up is, um, you know, are, are you gonna convert my benign acoustic neuroma into cancer? And I would say that that risk is extraordinarily low. There must be some risk, right? Even having a chest X-ray uh, as part of a routine physical or dental X-rays must pose some risk of secondary malignancy because we know that's one of the risks of radiation, of X-rays. Um, but as I'll show you, this has been used extensively for a large number of years around the world. And the amount of cases that we could say could potentially be cancer from this type of radiation is much less than the risk of dying on an operating table in today's very safe uh, day and age of doing surgery. For patients who have larger tumors around that two and a half centimeter mark, there is a small risk of hydrocephalus, which means the spinal fluid won't circulate appropriately. Uh, we don't also understand why that happens in some patients, but it's something that we watch for. And if it occurs, the treatment is to put in a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, which is an implanted catheter in the brain that drains the spinal fluid off. It's tunneled under the skin and dropped into the peritoneum or the belly to drain the fluid off. It's a completely concealed under the skin thing. It's a very low risk procedure um, and, it, and it treats the problem very effectively. And this is often what we see after uh, treatment. So what we want to do uh, is we tell the patients, you should have an MRI and a hearing test every year for the first three years. And usually patients can get that done at home and just send it to us. And then I review those results and I write the patient and say, your tumor looks stable or your tumor looks smaller or your tumor looks bigger. And this is when I want the next MRI scan. If we get past three years and everything looks stable, then we start to just image every other year for four years and then every third year for six years and then every four years for eight years and so on. And as long as the tumor doesn't grow, that's what we call success. But this is often what we see. We used to do an MRI at uh, three to six months and you'd often see the tumor look bigger and not enhance as much. And it turns out we never did anything with that information. So we basically stopped doing that three to six month scan and we now just check a scan at one year. Sometimes you do see in longer term follow-up more than three years, the tumor will actually get smaller. It will actually shrink. But we don't get excited at that early expansion um, or declare that failure or rush people to the operating room. 
The question often comes up, well, what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't stop the growth of the tumor? Well, there's basically two options. Usually in young, healthy people, if it doesn't work, we recommend removing the tumor, doing an operation. And I will say from our experience, it is more difficult to remove a radiated tumor than a non-radiated tumor, but it's a subtle distinction because some non-radiated tumors are very sticky and very difficult to remove. Um, and we've had very good luck with some radiated tumors too. <clears throat> what we found when we looked at our own data is our facial nerve outcomes were the same when we compared radiated to non-radiated tumors of the same size, but we were a bit more likely to end up leaving a little tumor behind in a case that had previously been radiated to preserve the facial nerve. Um, we used to say we would only treat the tumor once with radiation, but we have done repeat gamma knife on some patients particularly people who we thought doing a general anesthetic in an open operation would be too risky. Uh, and our results, we've done it about eight times, I think, um, over the 22 years that I've been doing this. Um, and, it's, and it's been very safe and so far effective. Um, but knowing it's a bit more difficult to operate on somebody after they failed radiation once makes me reluctant to do it twice unless I would say I really, really would never operate on this patient. Uh, now, if we do gamma knife and it fails and then we operate and we leave a small remnant, I have no hesitation about retreating that small remnant because it's a much smaller volume. The brainstem isn't gonna get any dose at all. And I think that's, that's a, a very safe. So people also say, Will my insurance pay for this? Is this experimental? Well, this is far from experimental. So if you look at worldwide, since statistics were started to be kept in 1968, more than a million patients have undergone gamma knife, not just for vestibular schwannomas, acoustic neuromas, but for a variety of benign and malignant tumors, vascular disorders, functional disorders. So I, I would say we have a good track record in 2019, which was the last year statistics are available worldwide, almost 10,000 acoustic neuromas were treated with gamma knife in that year alone. And if you go back since 1968, more than 125,000 acoustic neuromas have been treated worldwide with gamma knife alone. So that's not even including the tumors that have been treated with cyber knife or other linear accelerators or protons or so on. So no, this isn't experimental. We've got lots of follow-up data. Um, like I say, in, here in Rochester, Minnesota at Mayo Clinic, we've been doing it for 31 years now. So I think we can say with a lot of confidence that gamma knife radiosurgery is a well-established, low-risk, effective treatment for small and medium-sized acoustic neuromas. There's a very low risk of facial weakness. You have to be aware that hearing may deteriorate and continue to deteriorate for years. And long-term imaging follow-up is essential. You can't, um, you can't have treatment and then say, okay, I'm done, I'm treated. We need to make sure your tumor doesn't grow in follow-up. So that's, uh, those were just kind of some brief comments that I wanted to go over to hopefully ask some of the answer some of the preliminary uh, questions. I'll stop sharing my screen there. Thank you, Dr. Link. That was great. Um, I, it answered most of the questions I had written down, but we did have several um, come in from patients. So um, we'll go ahead and get started with those. Um, I thought this first one that's in the question box was a good one about the location of the tumor. Is that important, um, like where it is in the head, is that important um, as opposed to, or is it just the size when you determine whether or not you should do radiosurgery? Yeah, it really is the size. And we think about size actually in the radio surgery world a bit different than um, 
what uh, we think about in the surgical world. We think about mm -hmm. volumes, um, so more of a three-dimensional uh, uh, size. But but you know, acoustic neuromas really are always located in the same place. You know, they're in that bony canal called the internal auditory canal, and they're in the cerebellopontine angle next to the brainstem. And um, the good news is that the brainstem and the surrounding nerves are relatively tolerant of the radiation. But once we get up where the tumor's more than two and a half centimeters, then we get a little bit more nervous about it. But in terms of um, its position along that sort of axis where the tumor occurs, it doesn't matter too much. The one caveat that people debate that nobody knows the answer to very well, and at least in my opinion, is sometimes the tumors are very small, located in the internal auditory canal, mm -hmm. and they're way out at the end, sitting next to the cochlea. And so sometimes we will hear patients say, well, I went and saw this doctor, and they said I shouldn't have gamma knife because my cochlea will also get radiation and that will cause me to lose hearing. Mm -hmm. And and it's been hotly debated whether that is really an issue or not. And I think how it came to be is because that's the one thing we can measure. So we can see the cochlea on the imaging. We can calculate how much radiation the cochlea gets. But you might also ask, well, what about the cochlear nerve? How much radiation is that getting? Well, we can't see that very well on an MRI. Or how about the cochlear nucleus in the brainstem? How much radiation does that get? Well, we can't see that either. Mm -hmm. And so we can't calculate that. So I don't tell patients if their tumor is out near the cochlea, which many of them are, that they should not have a, a gamma knife for any type of radiation. Okay. That kind of leads me into another question that we had on Facebook, which was, you talk about the low risk of, um, of malignancy and, and radiation turning uh, the tumor into a malignant tumor. Is that the case for um, near other nearby structures as well, or is it only for the tumor? No. So um, yeah, that's a good question. There are two um, aspects to this. One is, could you take a benign tumor and make it malignant. Mm -hmm. uh, again, theoretically, there must be some risk of this. With more than a million patients treated worldwide for a variety of things, that seems to be an extremely, uh, extremely low risk. And then the other thing is the brain next to it, right? People mm -hmm. get primary brain cancer. Could this cause brain cancer? Um, and uh, I think I mentioned at one of the other sessions, there was an interesting case report published in the literature where uh, somebody had had surgery for an acoustic neuroma, and then several years later developed a glioblastoma, which is mm -hmm. brain cancer, next to where that operation had taken place. And I will say, we don't think there's any connection whatsoever. It sort of is the reverse lottery. You know, you it's just horrible, horrible bad luck. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which is gets back to why do people get acoustic neuromas? You right. know, I think there's a Nobel Prize waiting for us if we can answer that question. But so far, nobody knows the answer to that. Um, so, the, so there is the theoretical risk that it could cause a benign tumor to become malignant or normal brain tissue to become malignant. But again, I I strongly counsel patients that risk is so small. I think you should put it out of the equation as you're trying to decide. Uh, what to do. Okay. Uh, we have a couple questions in here about MRI follow-up. And in one of the previous presentations, we talked about a Fiesta or Dr. Carlson mentioned a yeah. Fiesta sequence. And so doing those follow-up MRIs without the gadolinium and without the contrast, basically, um, is that um, something that you ask of your patients um, as they do those follow-up uh, imaging? So yes, it's a really good point, and I'm glad somebody brought up that uh, that question. I was a bit remiss in discussing that. So there's really good evidence now that um, um, we certainly want to give the gadolinium, which is the type of contrast used for uh, uh, MRI scans to target the tumor, but we don't really always need that in follow-up. Again, it's it's widely debated. So actually some researchers here at Mayo Clinic um, 
looked at and found that gadolinium, this compound, can be retained in some of the tissues in the brain. And so people got very worried about that. Is that going to harm me? So far, at least, an MRI, you know, is not new. You know, MRI has been around since the 80s. Mm -hmm. There's been no indication that gadolinium is harmful in any way. Um, but if people are worried about that and they say, I don't want to get gadolinium for my follow-up scans, I say, that's okay. I think if you do these, um, um, so I think it's uh, General Electric uses Fiesta and Siemens is the company uses what's called the KISS, C-I-S-S imaging. And there's also uh, one of the companies, it's called Space. And all these things stand for something like uh -huh. Fiesta's fluid inversion, something something steady, steady state acquisition. A anyway, it's all, it's all uh, uh, kind of uh, physics mumbo jumbo mm -hmm. to get very uh, detailed imaging. And that's quite fine. So if you want to do your follow-up that way, that, that's no problem whatsoever. Okay. Um, one of our questions on Facebook, uh, you mentioned the different types of radiation. There's gamma knife and cyber knife. And this one uh, mentions FSRT, which I think is fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy. Right. And asking about the your current experience with lifelong tumor control um, with that kind of therapy, and this patient is seven years out. But um, if that is as effective, or if it's different, or whatever, than than the gamma knife and sure. So I mean, theoretically, it's different, and it and it and again, it depends on how many fractions. And over the years, over the last two decades, you know, just about every. Um, Every different fractionation scheme, meaning how many treatments are given to deliver the dose desired, ha have been tried. So, um, you know, uh, gamma knife is typically done in one in one day. We think, again, with some physics uh, and radiobiological analysis, that giving a benign tumor one dose works better than breaking the dose up, but uh, FSRT has been shown to be very effective. And mm -hmm. so some people break it up over 25 treatments and some people even break it up over 30 treatments and give, you know, 45 gray or 50 gray. Um, and, and, and again, the results um, and the risk profile have been, have been quite good. We don't have much experience. Um, early on, um, I'll say back in the mid nineties, when we did have some patients who failed a uh, single fraction gamma knife and we were afraid to do the same treatment twice, then we did have patients undergo FSRT and get mm -hmm. 25 or 30 fractions with good result. And again, a good risk profile. Okay. Um, and like I say, people, it, I, I frankly, for a lot of this, to me, it becomes a Coke versus Pepsi argument. Uh, it's, I can't tell the difference, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it all tastes the same to me. Right. Um, right. And, and when you look at the results, you know, I think the important thing is, you know, you're treated by someone and a center that does a lot of this. Um, you know, if, if um, and, and, you know, where we live in the upper Midwest, you know, some people live in quite remote areas and they ask me, gee, um, you know, there's a cancer center down the road. Um, can I just have this treatment there? And I usually say, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't doubt mm -hmm. that they're very good at, you know, doing radiation for breast cancer or lung cancer or something, but if they're not treating brain tumors frequently, I don't think it's not, it's not the same. Right. Okay. Um, what about having this kind of treatment if you're pregnant? Is that something that, um, so, um, yes. Um, so uh, the good news, um, I think, as uh, Dr. Driscoll mentioned during one of our other um, webinars, is the good news about acoustic neuromas is rarely ever is the treatment urgent. And certainly with mm -hmm. radio surgery, it wouldn't be an urgent treatment. So um, it turns out uh, that it actually would be quite safe because the fall off of the radiation is so steep and we can shield the baby. Uh, so just put a lead apron over, over the mother's uh, tummy. So potentially, theoretically, you could treat it. And we have done that. 
um, uh, in, in some unfortunate situations where women have metastases of cancer to the brain. But for an acoustic neuroma, I don't think there would ever be an indication, frankly, to do it. I would say, um, you know, get through pregnancy and delivery, and then, you know, we can treat you in the postpartum period. And then there's absolutely zero risk to the baby. And, um, you know, there's no, um, again, the patient doesn't become radioactive. So there's no interruption of breastfeeding or anything mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between gamma knife and cyber knife and then proton beam? We get that question a lot. And yeah. what, you know, what patients might be treated with proton beam? Yeah. So um, the difference, the main differences between gamma knife and cyber knife, uh, once again, is that gamma knife is usually done with a stereotactic head frame attached mm -hmm. to the patient's head. So I have had patients say, that sounds like the most awful barbaric thing <laughs> anybody's ever proposed to me. And I would never let you do that. Mm -hmm. I say, okay, well, there's an alternative. And now actually we can do gamma knife with a mask based treatment. The latest version of the gamma unit allows that. Mm -hmm. um, we still are quite strong in feeling that, boy, we've been doing this for 30 years, 31 years now, and have great results. So we don't want to change the direction of the ship here. Mm -hmm. um, but for some people, that's the right thing. With CyberKnife, it is done with a mask. Um, so with CyberKnife, most often patients do get a fractionated treatment, meaning three to five treatments. And again, people debate at our meetings, what's better, what's radiobiologically better, um, what's more convenient, why would you have a treatment that takes three or five days if you could have it done in one day? Um, there was a lot of interest early on that maybe fractionating would be better for hearing long term. Mm -hmm. It turns out the results are basically about the same. So the, at least there hasn't been good proof that doing three or five or even 25 fractions is better for hearing long term. But that was one of the initial uh, theories uh, with both treatments. You know, you're just lying on a table um, with the cyber knife. It's one beam but it moves, it keeps coming in from different angles. And with gamma knife, it's 192 beams that all come in and meet at one spot. Mm -hmm. um, but the basic principles are the same. Uh, and what that means is the radiation is the same. It's a photon, which is a, uh, a charged particle that travels through the skin and the skull and the brain and into the tumor and then out the other side. And each individual beam is very weak. But where you make all the beams converge, you get the full effect, the full damage to the tumor's DNA that prevents it from growing anymore. Um, now with protons, proton, how you get protons, and we have a proton unit here in Rochester, but we don't have any intention of using it to treat acoustic neuromas, but some centers do. Um, how you get a proton is you need a, a cyclotron. So that's uh, this device that accelerates hydrogen atoms until the electron is stripped off and then you're only left with a proton. So that takes a big footprint. So that's something the size of a football field. Um, so it's, it's hard to install one of those in downtown Manhattan. But uh, here in, on the prairie, we had no problem with that. Um, and then basically a kind of like you aim a, a a beam of radiation, then it's just aimed at the aimed at the tumor. And the thing about protons is they travel a known distance and then they give off all the, their energy. So there's no exit dose. So for certain things, we think protons are absolutely fantastic. So for instance, um, if we have to give spinal radiation to a child, one of the problems in the past was always the vertebral bodies would also get a lot of radiation, which then destroys the bone marrow. And that can be a problem long-term in terms of growth and development. With protons, you give the, the radiation and the particle gives off its energy and there's no exit dose that would bother the vertebral bodies. Um, and for certain <laughs> kinds of cancers in adults, it's really a great treatment. 
Um, there is literature out there about protons and acoustic neuromas. And once again, the results look pretty darn similar to what we do with Gamma Knife or what's done with Cyber Knife at some other institutions and so on. So it's a valid treatment. It's usually delivered over 25 or 30 treatments. So again, mm -hmm. it brings up the argument, you know, is it necessary to have 25 or 30 treatments if you can have a one day treatment and so on? Um, but I, I don't think there's a big advantage to it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with using it. Okay. Um, I think you addressed this a little bit in your talk, but the per there was a question about the percentage of failure of gamma knife to stop um, the growing tumor. And then if you can tell the factors that, that play into the role of that failure. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So again, if you look at all the literature um, on a gamma knife, one of the things that became interesting uh, uh, many years ago um, is how do you define failure? So it happened in the literature that people would say, we treated um, 100 patients and only two of them required additional treatment. So we define failure as the need for additional treatment after the initial gamma knife treatment. Therefore, the success is 98%. But I think, frankly, that's a little bit disingenuous because the goal of the treatment is to get the tumor to stop growing. So that is the benchmark, I think. So what I wanna know is if you treat 100 patients, how many actually stopped growing? The reason I say that is if you take a small tumor, let's say a four millimeter tumor and treat it and it grows to eight millimeters, well, I would say it's failed, but the patient doesn't need additional treatment, right? It's not threatening their life in any way. You could let it continue to grow. You could let it grow to a centimeter or a centimeter and a half or even two centimeters. And that would take likely many years and one of the other issues is when you look at the literature, most people say, well, we treated 100 patients and the average follow-up is three years. Well, I think to everybody on the call, three years is only one tick of the clock in our lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we want to know, you, you know, what, what about 30 years? What about 50 years uh, from now? So with all that long-winded caveat, when I look at the literature, I really think that the success rate for gamma knife is somewhere between 93 and 95%, meaning 93 to 95% of treated patients can say with good long-term follow-up that their tumor is not growing. And as I'd mentioned, we often do see in a delayed fashion, five or more years out, the tumor actually start to shrink which is obviously a very reassuring sign mm -hmm. that we have tumor control. 31 years ago, when we started to do this at Mayo Clinic, when I was just starting my training, there was concern that, well, maybe it'll work for five years or 10 years. And then we're gonna see this flood of people come back with growing tumors that we're then gonna have to operate on. And it turns out that never came to be. So it seems if you get a good five years of definite radiographic tumor control, meaning looking at serial MRIs, either with gadolinium or Fiesta imaging and the tumor looks stable, you're probably in the clear. You know, it's rare, rare, rare that we see somebody come back more than five years and now their tumor's growing and we say, oh shoot, we gotta do, we gotta do something else. Mm -hmm. And the other part of that question, which, you know, is right up there in my mind um, with trying to get the Nobel prize of medicine is can we predict which tumors are gonna fail? Because I don't think it's too far from the truth to say, if I knew Gamma Knife was going to stop every small or medium-sized tumor I saw, uh, I mean, that would be the treatment, right? I mean, how can you argue about a one-day outpatient treatment versus a major intracranial operation? So, um, but obviously it doesn't work every time. And there's some consequence if it doesn't work. As I mentioned, the surgery is more difficult. So we've tried to look at a lot of things. Uh, um, patients' um, age and um, their hearing status and how their tumor looks on variety of these different MRI sequences. Um, we put a bunch of patients in a special MRI scanner on a special pillow that shakes the head. 
to see if we could determine how firm or soft the tumor is. Um, patients didn't like that very much, but uh, <laughs> it wasn't too bad, but they didn't like it very much. Um, but the only thing we've come up with so far is that we found that fast growing tumors did not respond as well to gamma knife. So we do follow most new tumors. So we see a patient, we say, yep, we think you have an acoustic neuroma, it's small, you still have good hearing, let's follow it. If it grows more than two and a half millimeters in a year, we only got about 70% of tumor control. Only 70% of those patients had long-term tumor control versus if the tumor was growing less than two and a half millimeters a year, our tumor control rate was more than 98%. So nowadays in an otherwise healthy person, if we see their tumor grow more than two and a half millimeters a year, we say, I think we should take it out. I'm not against doing gamma knife if the patient, because the odds are still pretty good. 70% isn't a bad, isn't a bad ratio, but I would lean them more towards, uh, towards surgery. Um, we would love to be able to have a blood test or, you know, do a spinal tap and look at the spinal fluid and find something, something to key us in that this tumor is either going to, or not going to respond to radiation, but so far we're not there. Well, and that was one of the questions that I had um, from a patient, and this was from an earlier session, but they were asking, what's the key determinant to determining uh, radi radio surgery versus um, microsurgery? And it sounds like there's not one, but there are some key things that you really look for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, and that's the, frankly, that's why I I still find this interesting after a lot of years of doing this, you know, seeing thousands of acoustic neuroma patients. I mean, it's always, it's always fascinating. Um, so I would say probably the number one factor that determines who has radiation and who has surgery is the patient. Mm -hmm. um, uh, fortunately, most tumors are discovered when they're small and people have options. Now, if the tumor is large, then we say you need an operation and, and, and the decision-making gets much easier. But, you know, we ask people to kind of, what's your priority or how do you feel about this? Some people say, look, doc, I just got to get this out. I, you know, the thought of this thing in my head and it could be growing and I, I got to get it out. And other people are like, oh gosh, I'm fine. If I don't need treatment, I'll watch it. Or if you've got a way that you don't have to wheel me into the operating room and I can go back to work on Monday, I, I want that option. Mm -hmm. um, um, so it, it absolutely is true that, um, you know, we call it clinical equipoise in, in medicine where there just is not a right or wrong or a definite uh, best uh, a treatment. And we've tried to look at it from every angle we can think of, um, including asking the patients after mm -hmm. we did the treatment, are you happy or not? Do you like mm -hmm. what you decided? And we asked that very question. We said, um, are you uh, glad you made the decision you made? Would you recommend the decision you made to another person with the same diagnosis? And would you recommend the, the uh, treatment you had to one of your family members? And no matter whether it's observation, radiation, or surgery, um, upwards of 90% of people say, yes, I'm, I'm happy about what I decided. And as I mentioned, I think in one of the other sessions, um, there's some really interesting uh, behavioral science uh, behind this in that um, there was recently a paper that came out that looked at what we call paternalistic decision-making and um, independent decision-making. So um, long before I came along, uh, doctors would say to patients, um, here's what you got and here's what we're gonna do. Um, not really like that, but that's the general idea, right? And, yep. and for the most part, patients were like, okay, you're the doctor. <laughs> Um, and thankfully, thankfully, right, we've all become much better consumers of everything in our lives, including healthcare. So um, uh, that is a very rare situation now where we say to the patient, this is what you got, and this is absolutely what you need. And every physician in the world is going to say the same thing to you. So you just have to decide if you like me or not, and you want me to do the, your treatment. So um, uh, it turns out when you ask people to make, um, and, and, and so it turns out 
overall, people don't like paternalistic decision making. They don't like to be told what they're supposed to do. That's, I don't think, any surprise. And I bet it's a, 10 times more appropriate in the United States than almost anywhere else. If you just look at what's happened in this last year with the pandemic and how people mm -hmm. react to restrictions and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, it turns out we become very invested in our important decisions in our life. So if you take it out of the world of acoustic neurons, if you ask people, are you happy with the house that you bought? Are you happy with the person that you married? Most people will say, yes, that was a brilliant decision I made. Because I mean, there's no, none of us have a more expensive purchase than our home. I mean, none of us are, you know, more invested in any relationship than our marriage and so on and so forth. So it's very interesting that, um, and sometimes even people who, you know, have, let's say gamma knife and it doesn't work and then they have to have surgery, they'll still say, yeah, I was, I'm glad I went that route. I'm glad I made those decisions. I felt good about that. Um, which again, gets back to what do we really want out of this? Well, we want happy patients. We mm -hmm. want, you know, we want pe people to feel like they participated in the decision-making and, and are happy with it. Well, and we see that with acoustic neuroma patients, you know, all, all the time it's, you know, unless there's some kind of emergent situation, it tends to be something that they can, um, participate in. And, um, for some patients, that's a blessing. And for some patients, it becomes difficult and overwhelming, but, um, yes. you know, I think, I think yeah. the attitude of the team at Mayo is great in the sense that I think Dr. Driscoll said in an earlier presentation that, you know, it is, you know, your job to present the options, but then also to, to give your recommendation or guidance too. And so that's, I think, helpful for patients because they can, they can participate in the decision, but also have some, some guidance from experts, which is, you know. And I certainly lost track long, long ago, many times Dr. Driscoll and I, or Dr. Carlson and I, or Dr. Neff and I would be standing in the workroom, looking at an audiogram and looking at an MRI scan and say something like, oh, wow, this is a, this is a really good one for us to do a hearing preservation operation on. And um, that's, uh, that's what we're going to recommend. And then you go in and visit with the patient for 30 or 45 minutes. And you say, that would be the absolutely wrong thing for you to do. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. the, the, and, and I mean, like I say, that's why it's been so interesting and kind of helping patients along and figuring out what's best for them. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, the, the question that we always get, and, and I, I blame Oprah for this, is uh, um, uh, the question we always get is, well, what would you do? Yeah. You know, what would you, what would you do if it, if it was you or, you know, what if I was your brother or sister or wife or daughter or son or something, what would, what would you do? And, and I always say it's, you know, it's such an individual, you know, uh, I, I would say if you were my brother or sister, I'd say, you got to make a decision. You know, you got to decide what's the best thing for you because my priorities might be, might be very right. different. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we're coming to the end of our time, but I have one more question. We have had several different in, in lots of different ways, different questions about side effects long-term. So um, somebody asked about side effects uh, down the line from Gamma Knife. Somebody asked about um, a metal taste during Gamma Knife, if that's common. And then somebody else asked about numbness at the, at the site of, of, um, you know, I guess where you, I, I would guess with Gamma Knife. At the pin site, yeah, maybe mm -hmm. at one of the yep. pin sites. Yeah. So the taste thing is interesting. So it turns out one of the things the facial nerve does for us is it provides taste from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. So some people either after surgery or after radiation, if that part of the facial nerve doesn't work quite well, they will describe uh, a metallic taste. I've had a lot of patients, uh, mainly after surgery, say certain foods like red wine and chocolate taste metallic. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that gets better with time. I've not had anybody describe it during the actual treatment, um, yeah, so but I don't doubt that that, um, that uh, happened and so on. But I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. think it would be a persistent, uh, persistent issue. And then um, I have had rarely patients, uh, usually in the back of the head, describe some numbness mm -hmm. where a pin was, because um, it may have gone into uh, one of the cutaneous nerves there. And mm -hmm. also that typically gets better. I've not had anybody have any long-term pain from where the, where the pins go. What about um, um, like the, where the radiation site is, where the actual 
So I've never had anybody have any symptoms from that again, because it's 192 sure. different low energy beams. So it's kind of spread out, um, which is why people don't get any hair loss or sunburn or those kinds of things that you might have heard about with kind of old fashioned radiation. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. Well, Dr. Ling, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. We've answered a lot of questions. I know we haven't answered all of them. I'll be um, uh, tracking these and we have an Ask the Doc session this afternoon at 4.30 Eastern time. So maybe we might be able to bring some of these into, um, into that section. That session. Um, that panel will feature, feature Dr. Driscoll, who um, has been with us before. He's in Rochester. Dr. Lundy and Dr. Jachana, who are in Jacksonville in Florida at Mayo, and then Dr. Neff, who's also um, in, uh, in Rochester. So again, that's at 4.30 Eastern time this afternoon. If you have questions for that session, in addition to the ones here, um, feel free to email them to me. My email address is development at anausa.org. And um, we really wanna thank you for attending today and for submitting all these questions and, and Dr. Link again for your time. That's been great. Thanks very much. Thanks everybody for tuning in. All right, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.